we used to talk about aspirin and whether it was useful to prevent uh, coronary cardiovascular events in people who have no known coronary artery disease, primary prevention. Has the data that has come out changed this? So no conflicts of interest. And what I'm going to talk about briefly in the 12 or 13 minutes I have is a little bit of uh, basic science as to how does aspirin work. I think it's critical to remember this because a lot of us assume it should work to prevent cardiovascular disease. But if you go back and think about how it works, you will start having questions. And then we'll talk a little bit about the older trials or the older guidelines, the new data, the latest guidelines, and then the take-home points. So here's a question for you, um, going back to your MBBS days. So which of these statement or statements do you agree with? Uh, Lodo's aspirin works on the endothelium. If an aspirin is so good, taking more will be better, both or neither of them. Please start the timer. So I was hoping the response would be all over the place. That means the next couple slides are use, going to be useful. And I won't give you the correct answer. So this is how, I think most of you know, this is how we get heart attacks, right? So this is the histology. This is a plaque with a necrotic core. It has a little bit of a very thin cap. When the cap ruptures, the blood is exposed to it and you get a white thrombus. And a white thrombus is formed of platelets, right? So you say, okay, if I give someone that prevents the platelets from uh, clotting, then that thrombus won't form. What's the problem with that theory? The problem is the atherosclerosis is still going on. And aspirin <laughs> does not prevent that. So I think it's very critical to remember that the role of aspirin is after the plaque is formed and after the plaque ruptures, not before that. Another thing to remember, there is the good guy and the bad guy. So going back to med school again, thromboxin A2 is the bad guy and prostacyclin is the good person. Thromboxin A2 is in the platelets and it causes platelet aggregation. Prostacyclin is in the endothelium, it prevents platelet aggregation. And unfortunately, aspirin works on thromboxane A2, which is great, but it also blocks prostacyclin, which is not so great. And the current theory is that this is how it works. So it blocks cyclooxygenase. You all know the COX-1 and COX-2. When you give aspirin at a low dose, you know, 75 to 100 milligrams, some people would say even less, you're blocking almost only COX-1, which prevents formation of thromboxane, which is the bad guy. Remember that, the red devil is the thromboxane. If you give a full dose aspirin, more than 325, you're probably going to start blocking prostacyclin, and then you start losing some of the benefits. So it doesn't mean that aspirin is antiplatelet, so you should give more. So this is the current working theory. Now, as you think about aspirin and primary prevention, you got to think also of a few other things. One, that yes, it'll prevent events, that's a given. But it increases the risk of bleeding, you all know that. And more recently, there is data that it also prevents cancer, mostly colorectal cancer. How do you factor this in? So how do you put all these three things together and make a decision when you're seeing a patient whether to put them on aspirin or not? So, busy slide. The point to make here is the story starts all the way back in 1974. You know, Keir just talked about the history of angioplasty, but the first trial showing some benefit of aspirin for secondary prevention was back in the 70s. And after that, the FDA 
approved it for secondary prevention. Remember, this is secondary prevention. For primary prevention, as you can see, all the other highlighted uh, bullets, aspirin was never approved by the FDA for primary prevention. The United States Preventive Services Task Force came out with its guidelines, and this is 2009. And you can see it actually had a grade A recommendation for primary prevention for middle-aged men and slightly older women. So this is 2009. 2016, they watered this down. It became a grade B recommendation. And again, this is when they started to say you have to calculate the 10-year risk. So if you have someone who is middle-aged, primary prevention, 10-year risk more than 10%, you start thinking about aspirin, but you still have to think about the risk of bleeding. So this is what we were at before the most recent studies. Now, the cancer studies, um, two big prospective cohort studies, lots and lots of patients, and what they found was that it reduces colorectal cancer, the relative risk reduction is 0.81. The thing is, we already screen for colon cancers, right? So most of you hopefully get colonoscopies and recommend them. So what if someone's already getting a colonoscopy? Does aspirin prevent cancer on top of that? So the summary is, it actually does. If they are not doing colonoscopies, you would still uh, need to treat a lot of people to prevent 33 cancers. If you are getting colonoscopies, you still need to treat a lot of uh, patients per year to prevent colorectal cancer. Aspirin does has a benefit. So remember that in people at high risk for colorectal cancers. The problem with previous studies, though, was one, Cardiology was not as advanced as it is right now. There weren't statins. The diagnosis was not as good. So then we came up with three new studies. And I just remember them as ASPRI ends with E, so it's for the elderly. ASCEND ends with D, so it's for diabetes. And the last one is ARRIVE. I don't have a good, reason, good way to remember this, but that's for people with somewhat higher risk. So they took a look at these three groups of people, three different trials, all in NEJM, all came out in the same year. And let's take a very quick look at them in the few minutes we have. So the ASPRI, remember, E is for the elderly. So they looked at people over 70. In blacks and Hispanics, they took people over 65. And what they looked at was the primary uh, outcome measure, which included all-cause mortality, but it also included dementia and disability. And you can see per 1,000 patients, uh, person years, aspirin was literally no different than placebo. In fact, the all-cause mortality and the cancer risk actually went up on aspirin. Now, this is not very well explained. Most people would say that you need to be on aspirin more than 4.7 years to get the cancer benefit. But be as it may, that is a problem with this. And so essentially, no one would recommend starting aspirin in someone more than 70. It's really the issue. If they are already on aspirin at that point, the trial does not answer that question. The ASCEN trial, which is the patients with diabetes, uh, long story short, it was a well done study. Um, it does cause some reduction in the cardiovascular endpoint, no significant reduction in all-cause mortality, increased risk of bleeding. Essentially, you have to do an individualized decision-making in patients with diabetes. Don't automatically start them on aspirin. And finally, the ARRIVE trial. Again, uh, this is people with 10 to 20 percent uh, CAD risk, CVD risk, and the last line is the answer. You still have to individualize management. So, what did these three trials add to what we know? And so up till 2016, we saw the data was it was a grade B recommendation. 2019, new guidelines were issued. And you can look at the summary right here. Re recommend against aspirin in individuals older than 70. That was the uh, ARRIVE trial. And provide a very weak recommendation that it might be considered in other adults 40 to 70. So that's kind of where we are left. Not a very clear-cut answer.
but the evidence is getting more and more against using aspirin. So what are the take home points? First, I think uh, Keir already mentioned, stress what you can already do. Get the risk factors under control, exercise, smoking prevention, treat the hypertension, treat the lipids. The other problem is that as the studies have come out, we have become better at detecting non-fatal MI, the quote silent MIs. We pick these up, but previous trials did not pick them up. And can aspirin prevent these non-fatal MIs? Is there a benefit to it? It wasn't measured in the primary endpoint, but if you look at this, what if 10, 15 years later, people who do get non-fatal MIs actually have problems like heart failure? Is it worth preventing that? I think it's something, it's an open issue. We need to think about this. And uh, finally, if you do put people on aspirin, do your best, including eradicate H. pylori, cut back on NSAIDs, stop uh, alcohol, try and consider enteric coated to try and reduce the GI risk as much as possible. Um, what does this mean? What do these trials mean for secondary prevention? The jury is still out. I think it's absolutely obvious that we, right now with current data, would use aspirin for secondary prevention, but there are studies going on for whether um, you should use other antiplatelet agents versus aspirin. You know, we had, we had the Capri trials many years ago, and so now looking at ticlopidine and uh, clopidogrel and others, whether they, are, they could be substituted for aspirin and how good they are. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much.